The Art of the Pivot is brought to you by Signavio. Hello and welcome to another Art of the Pivot conversation. My name is Mark Jeffries and today we're joined by Wellington Holbrook, the Chief Operating Officer for Connect First Credit Union, one of the largest and most successful credit unions in Canada. Connect First is headquartered in Calgary and serves 128,000 members across 40 communities in central and southern Alberta. As Chief Operating Officer, Wellington is responsible for the organization's key operational functions, including retail branches, small business and agriculture, commercial and corporate banking, wealth management and marketing. For the past 25 years, Wellington has served in senior executive roles in major financial institutions throughout Alberta. He is highly respected for his deep experience in digital and business transformation strategy. Wellington, welcome to you. Where do we find you today? I'm in Calgary, Alberta, where it's uh, still feeling a little bit too much like winter, to be honest with you. Little chilly. We, we've had a warm up here in Boston and I was walking around in short sleeve t-shirts. Ridiculous. It's still freezing. Um, Jealous, so let's get I'm into it. Away. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Tell us about Connect First Credit Union. Maybe give us a bit of the origin story. You bet, Mark. Um, the credit union movement has been around in Alberta and Western Canada for you know, over 100 years. But in the last few years, something uh, rather mar marvelous has really happened for us. Uh, four really substantial credit unions in Alberta came together uh, to create Connect First. And in doing so, uh, have made us one of the largest credit unions in Canada. But it's given us an opportunity to reimagine ourselves and reinvent ourselves a bit. So we're, we're literally doing a do-over. Like, what does a credit union look like for the 2020s? That's pretty exciting. So let, let's dig into that, this reimagining the idea of a financial institution. I mean, what does that actually mean? Why, why is it so important to do now? You know, I believe in the last decade or two, maybe longer, quite frankly, as technology has really started to transform the banking industry, I think in many respects, many financial institutions um, have almost been following like a herd mentality. Like the new experience is all digital, the new experience is just going to look like X. And I think what, as a result, I think what the experience is looking more and more like for consumers, for businesses, is a lot of the same. And I think um, we have this unique opportunity just because of these circumstances to say, well, like, what if that wasn't the case? Like, if you were actually designing a financial institution for today, for the needs of people, the needs of small, medium-sized businesses today, how would you do things differently? And, and I think what we're, the answer that we're getting as we're talking to our members, as we're talking to Albertans, Canadians, is that actually there's a longing among many for a very, very different kind of experience than what others are offering. So I'm interested in that because you could argue that from an outside perspective, the public, people like me, we, don't, we seem a bit indifferent about financial institutions, right? We select brands based on convenience and, and just the, the basic stuff that I guess aren't part of your purview of this recreation. How far is that true? And is that in any way shaping the work that you're doing now, the very creative work? Yeah, I, you know, I think it is true to an extent, like we all are looking for convenience, we're all looking for those things. But I think it's a little bit like fast food, like it's something many of us enjoy a lot of the time, because it's practical, it's convenient, you go to the food court, if you're working somewhere, you get something to eat. And, but having said that, is that how you make decisions for your, you know, your, your better health in the long run, you know, generally speaking, people are being very thoughtful about that. And I think the same should be true around financial services. You know, yes, it can be very convenient to transact using your know, modern services, digital apps and all of that. That's great. And we have to have those things, too. But I think there's a, a, a different kind of relationship potential that a lot of people are longing for um, that is, quite frankly, being neglected in a world where um, digital's become everything. And people, I think their financial well-being is actually being um, put aside. And we want to change that. All right. Well, it's a very worthy pursuit for sure. Um, so let's talk about certain elements of it. Service, for example, is a key expectation for credit union member satisfaction. You mentioned a little bit of that earlier. How do you decide from, from your position what level of service meets the bare minimum versus the level of service that sets you apart? Yeah, right on. 
So we measure everything just like every financial institution does, right? Like we have the standard metrics like net promoter score or you know, member service index and things like that. But And those are important. And I think they do provide an important measure as to whether or not we're meeting the minimum expectation of our members. But I, I think I'm a lot more and our team and our leaders here in our organization are a lot more concerned around how our members feel around their engagement with us and, and around their lives in general. Like we think about financial services like they're commodities, but truly they aren't because depending on the experience you have, you might sleep very differently, quite frankly. You buy a house, you take on a mortgage. It's one of the biggest decisions most people make in their lifetimes. And people stress about those things. They, they lose sleep. When we were going into the financial, or sorry, into the um, uh, COVID crisis a year ago, when we saw, you know, you know, shutdown of the economy, people losing jobs, people were losing sleep. What if I miss some payments on my mortgage? Well, quite frankly, having a relationship with a financial institution is more concerned around your financial well-being is going to be a lot more, I think, um, concerned with how you feel about the experience than just whether or not, you know, your, your payments are made. All right, now, I have to do this because my job is the interviewer, so let me be a bit cynical. I mean, in the end, it comes down to dollars and cents, right? How we feel about the fact there's no money left in our account isn't going to change the fact that there's no money left in our account. So what can you really do to change the way someone feels about the interactions that come every day? But I think that's where the strength of relationship comes comes from. It's a and relationship you know, it sounds so funny in financial services today. Like, do you know who your banker is? Do you know who you deal with? But I think <laughs> you do build relationships, even if that isn't the case. Like we think of, you know, the tech giants, overused examples, but people literally have a relationship with their phone and they ha they build, you know, comfort with apps that they go to for certain answers and so on. Yet in financial services, my view, and I think the view of what, we're, you know, the members we're speaking to, the public we're speaking to, there's, a, there's a, a significant chunk of the population who don't see themselves in that. Now, I'll give you a quick example, if I might. Uh, a very recent member that joined us shared a story that really, really, I think, resonated with me. She was in a situation where her mother had passed. She went to her traditional bank and said, you know, I have this inheritance. I'm going to deposit it. They said, that's great. Can we help you, you know, with the, the, your investment options? She said, yes. And then they quickly directed her to self-directing investment and investment options right. that they had available to her. And she walked into our organization and very same conversation, but the difference was she sat down with someone and talked about her options and they had a conversation. And quite frankly, that kind of relationship, that opportunity to have a conversation wasn't available anywhere else. And for that reason, she chose to join our organization as opposed to another. It's clearly a differentiator, but you're talking about the human to human connection which is always so valuable, especially during COVID because it's so rare nowadays. But what about technology? Because when it comes to technology, uh, I mean, everyone's trying to determine the, the best uses for it. And given that you are focusing so much on the human connection, how is Connect First making its determinations around how you decide when technology enhances, say, human effort uh, or when technology should actually replace it? Yeah, right on. We have certainly taken the approach and, and the view that where technology plays, is, it's for anything transactional. If it's transactional, it's, it should be convenient, it should be easy, it should be available to you whenever and however you want. But when it comes to making decisions in your life that are meaningful, that we should be trying to provide all of the, the options in every medium to be there and available for you to make you feel comfortable. Some people have high degrees of financial sophistication. They don't need a conversation. That's great. We provide information available through our, our apps and through the websites, et cetera. Great. But for those who you know, want to have a conversation around how do I leave my business to my children? How do I know if um, like what the right time is to exit the farm and pass it on to my kids? And big questions like that. I think most people want to have a conversation with someone who's seen it and you know, lived through that before. Very true, very true. You, you've obviously got a vision and uh, you're very inspiring the way you talk about it. So how do you then pass that to your team? Tell, tell me a bit more about your role, your team. Uh, as I understand it, you're responsible for managing key operational functions uh, for Connect First. How do you set up your team for success and, and how do you instill in them some of this vision that you have? So when we started this journey on becoming Connect First, I think one of the things we immediately realized is that as we were starting to imagine what our brand needs to be, 
that our culture needs to support that. And that meant every, each and every one of us had to take a pledge to say, this is, these are the things that I, agree, I am going to do. I'm committed to doing. And, and most of our team have really rallied around that. I think it's driven excitement to be a part of this organization because we believe that is truly different. On the other hand, some people have said, no, you know, like I see myself as a cruncher of mortgages. I see myself as a cruncher of numbers and, and I, I don't want to you know, have relationships with people. I don't want to, I don't see myself in that world and, and they, they can't be here anymore. Like we're really, we're really taking it seriously that our culture has to support the brand. We are all the brand. Okay, good. All right. Well, I like that. That's a very solid bit of messaging. And related to that, how do you then go about monitoring the way things flow through your organization, the process and the processes that are in place? How do you know, for example, when things are good, checking all the right boxes and when they aren't? And if you do see something that isn't right or is extremely good, um, do you then know instantly how to shift and maybe intensify focus? You know, we just recently went through a core banking and digital banking transformation over the course of the last few months. Quite a heavy lift, to, be, to say the least. So we have oodles and oodles of data, and I'll just be completely transparent to say we're just starting to really sift through that and understand how we can really use that data to bring better experiences to our member, uh, to our members. But in the meantime, um, we've we've taken some shortcuts. For example, and they, I wouldn't call these shortcuts. This is this is hard work. I put my email out to every single one of our members and they can communicate with me directly anytime. And if they do reach out to me, they're guaranteed a response. They, I get a lot of great wow. emails saying how much they appreciate their, their team, their, the folks they deal with in our organization. And I get some that are less happy saying, hey, you know, I've went through this and this isn't good enough. And I'll have a conversation with that member, but that's direct feedback that we're using to inform what we're going to change, yeah. what we're going to yeah. do better. It's very brave to put your email out there. Actually, it reminds me of a story, and I'm probably just butchering it, but there was a bank here in the US um, that in every branch had like one red telephone, like a bat phone. And if you picked it up, you would get through to the CEO and you would only meant to do it if you had a really serious issue of some sort. And apparently it was used and not that often. Yeah, right on. You know, that's, that's funny you say that actually. It comes in waves, um, and I would say, yeah, I probably don't hear from uh, someone every hour of the day, but I certainly hear from several of our members almost every day. And it's so great, like when you actually hear their real voice, we, uh, financial institutions so often we say the voice of the customer, voice of the member, whatever. Um, and, and I know we all sincerely want that to be true, but when you're actually hearing someone on the other end of the phone saying, this was my experience, it, it's, it, it, it makes it real. You know, if I could share just a very quick example, I spoke to a member not that long ago, and this was the eye opener for me. You know, we, we're a full service financial institution. We provide all sorts of services. And his question was, well, do you bank at, uh, at your credit union? And I, and I nice. fully bank. And I said, yeah, absolutely. I, I do. I am actually, um, I fully bank here because I believe in what we're trying to, to, to build. And I, I believe strongly I have to experience what our members experience. Um, if I'm going to be sincere and look my members in the eyes and say they should bank here. Uh, but he said to me, well, how can you do that when you don't offer X, X and X services? And I said, well, we, we do offer, you know, X, Y, Z services. And he said, no, no, you don't. I've been a member since 1980 and you don't offer those things. And it just, the light bulb went on. It's like, we're not doing, we're not having the right conversations with our members yet. Like if, if someone right. had been dealt with us for that long and we've been offering these services for most of that period of time and he didn't know it. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it brings back, brings us back to basics around, you know, how are we showing up every day and having conversations with our members? We can do better. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because I guess there's a role that AI can play. Because AI programmed right would start to understand the needs that a particular member might have at a certain point in their life or a certain point in the year and be able to offer it to them at exactly the right moment. So you take the human out for that moment, but then you bring the human back in to essentially do the deal. Yeah. And, you know, the human plays the role around creating the empathy and building that, that connection and, and trust but I totally agree with you. Technology is the game changer around how do you identify needs, especially at scale. As we're talking about, yep. we're in a business, we have 130,000 yep. members as you shared. Um, we can't be individually understanding each of them personally all the time. So there's no question AI plays a big role there. And 
And we're very fortunate to have just gone through our core banking digital transformation that we have because we're now in a place where we have um, our data all together. We have the right standards, the right availability of data to start driving the right kinds of, um, I think, answers for our members that they're looking for from us. So on the subject of that transformation, huge, really vast, far reaching. Is there anything you can share about how you've guided an organization through a change like this? I mean, how did you stay up and running uh, while doing this? Some people compare it to changing the wheels of a car while it's driving down the road. Yeah, totally. And and I think one of the things that um, the leadership at Connect First appreciated was it can either be a long and painful process where the members experience nothing but inconvenience, a little bit of inconvenience, almost a dying of a thousand cuts over the course of time, or we can just rip off the Band-Aid. And uh, a lot of work went into uh, sort of behind the scenes, um, clearing the way for a significant ex exercise that happened over the course of two weekends. So we put our members through a major inconvenience for two weekends, but we knew it was for the greater good to get us to a place where we would now be able to provide them with the services, the, the digital capabilities they expect in, you know, in 2021. Nice. Probably the easiest way to do it. I'm sure you gave out lots of fair warnings, so people knew what was coming. Wasn't a big well, surprise. You know, I told you. My email was out there. I talked to hundreds and hundreds of members in the days following that because it wasn't a fun experience for many. But the good news, it's behind us now. <laughs> Um, all right, we're almost at the end of our chat, and I wanted to, to close really on the subject of innovation, because you are clearly very innovative in a space that doesn't always see it. Uh, if you had a poster on the wall at the, your main head office that said, this is how we innovate, what kind of ideas might be on that poster? What, what are the, um, I guess, the essential guides within your organization around how you innovate? Wow, yeah, I mean, great question. And I don't know if I can answer it in terms of a set of guides, but I think it might be just creating permission and space for every employee in this organization to, to have a voice in that. So creating communities within our organization where we solve problems, complex problems in many cases, with you know every single voice in our organization coming together, whether it's the teller who's, who's in a branch to someone in our contact center, somebody in IT, somebody who makes innovation their job. Like all financial institutions, we have an innovation department, they're doing some big thinking. But I think the, the power of it is in the hands of, of the people who work here. So we've really are working, and we're not done. Like this is, a, this is, by the way, something we're working through, but it's establishing that culture where people feel the permission to try things, they feel supported if they don't work, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, we learn together. Well, with that in mind, here's my final question. You know, transformation, they say, is a journey without an end because it should never end. You should never just go, hey, that's it, everyone. We have stopped changing. Well done. Right? It's never going to happen. So with that in mind, is there anything new on the horizon, things you're already looking at or planning that maybe you could share with us? You know, um, I know uh, this is perhaps a little bit jurisdiction specific to Canada, but you know Canada is going through a lot of the open banking uh, transformation that the UK and Australia have uh, have seen already. Um, and I, I know there's different kind of aspects around that in the US, but we're looking at that and how we can play very, very differently in a world where I think a lot of the regional financial institutions in this country haven't been able to play on an equal playing field to the large banks. We think this is going to be a game changer for us with huge opportunity. There's challenges too, but uh, so we're starting to reimagine what our business model is going to look like. And a lot of what I'm talking about here around deepening relationships with members is playing very much into that future where we might be selling the products of other financial institutions to our members, but because we're focusing on how our members feel about their decisions, they're choosing to deal with us instead of others. Absolutely fascinating. Wellington Holbrook, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of a, an insight behind the organization and, and how you run so much change and so much innovation. Great chat. We really appreciate your time. Mark, it's a pleasure to be here. You're an outstanding interviewer. I'm a big fan. So thank you for having me. Thank you. The Art of the Pivot is brought to you by Signavio.